Okay, and we are live. It is Car Con Carne, no longer in a car, at least not for the foreseeable future. It's Quarantine Con Carne. It is life under COVID-19. Every day I'm doing this podcast until we are all released and set loose upon the world. Car Con Carne, Quarantine Con Carne, sponsored by C&H Financial Services. Business owners, at some point this too will pass and you'll be able to resume business. You'll be able to welcome customers into your doors c &H Financial Services is here to help. They can eliminate 100% of the fees associated with credit and debit cards as a form of payment. You're going to want that when we're all back to normal-ish. Remember this website address, freeprocessingnow.com, or the phone number, 855-600-2437, extension 999. My guest today, all the way across the pond, it is Jared from ChemLab, uh, one of Carcon Carney's favorite people. Look at that. You are, you are metal AF, Jared. Uh, it's can, I, can I just point out like that but i like it i love that you got in character for this interview in chicago over in london can you like stand up and show your shirt this is old school cabaret metro yep yep wear that it is, with pride that is intentional oh yeah oh yeah i mean i wear it all the time it's one of my favorite shirts it's old and beat up but you know yeah yeah i'm wearing it with pride that's uh <laughs> One of my favorite places to play and perhaps one of my most favorite cities ever to play and live in and hang well, I, out. In. I mentioned uh, when we went live on Facebook in, in the text that you are an honorary Chicagoan because really we, we think of you as one of ours. When I set up this interview, like, I, I just didn't, my head didn't even connect the fact that you were in the UK. I just, I think of you as this American yeah. dude. And, just hanging out at Wrigleyville probably, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, how is life in London right now? Um, actually, we're really in luck. Um, and hi to everybody, and thank you, James, for having me. This is uh, it's always an honor, uh, and you've always got great questions, so uh, this is a, it's a real pleasure. Um, and I love you, Chicago, too. Um, we're about an hour south of London, so um, we're just on the coast right near Brighton, hours train ride south, which is good because London is just cratering at the moment, as is Birmingham. They're yeah. both in really, really epidemic proportion. Um, it's pretty horrendous. We're, I feel much more secure and sequestered down here in a way. Um, and I was supposed to be up in London last week to be uh, going into a studio and doing some audiobook recording because I do a bunch of audiobook recordings. And um, I, I don't think I knew that. Mm, oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, That's wonderful. I, I yeah. love uh, my Audible subscription is one of my favorite things. I, I don't lean on it as much right now just because of the pandemic, but I love listening to audiobooks. Yeah. Yep. Well, and I like doing it. Um, and I've had a passionate relationship with the microphone for about 45 years now and take direction well, which is good. I've done a bunch of voiceover stuff for ads and video games. And uh, it's a great video game that I did a couple of years ago, actually five or six years ago now called That's You on Sony PlayStation. That's a social interactive game and I'm the voice all the way through it. It's uh, loads of fun, I adore it. Um, but I just, uh, I was not interested in, going up to London and putting myself into a situation where I knew that the tube was going to be an issue. The subway yeah. there is still just crammed with people. And even if it's not crammed with people, there are far too many people out for one to be able to maintain the sort of distance that you really have to do if you have, oh, I don't know, a basic understanding of basic science, uh, basic <laughs> common sense, uh, human compassion, I don't know, any, any of those simple things that a certain segment of the global population doesn't seem to have. I, I guess what I'm surprised, what I'm surprised most by is the fact that you don't have a studio in your home to record that stuff. Mm. It's because I'm not a musician. You know, I've had the pleasure and the honor of working with incredibly talented people like, you know, Daniel and Vince and Mike and, uh, you know, the latest, greatest and last iteration of ChemLab. Those guys make me look good. I studied drums when I was a kid because I like to bash on stuff. You know, that's why guys play baseball. Who doesn't like to hit a ball with a stick? <laughs> exactly. You know, 
but I was never particularly good. My sense of timing is good for a singer, but everybody knows that the singer has to follow the drummer. So how good is his sense of timing really? <laughs> um, and I played the vibraphones for a while when I lived in Ghana and West Africa in the mid seventies. I studied banjo with this hilarious globe trotting anthropologist. He taught me to play the banjo, um, but I was never, I was never a, a natural at any of those things but I was writing the whole time that I was learning all these instruments. So like not having to drive when you live in New York City, you know, I never had to drive an instrument because I always had somebody else that was doing the driving, so to speak. And so I don't, I've never really needed a studio here that would do anything more than vocals. As it turns out, because the audiobook market is going to move into um, the purview of people who have home studios, I am at this moment getting myself set up to be able to put a studio right above me to continue to do audiobook work because I'm not, you know, Maya, my wife is immunocompromised. I'm not going to go and put her at risk. Um, Django, love him to pieces. He's always a little funky and right at the edge of stuff. And it's just not worth it. They are the most important things in my whole life. And so, great. If I can work from home and set up a studio here, awesome. That's what I'm going to do. Much I? I would love to see just the complete expanse and devastation of London, just devoid of people. The apocalypticist in me wants to see all of that and take all the photographs and, you know, turn them into like ultra terrestrials videos for later on. Oh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to the apocalypse, apocalypticist in you. Easy for you to say. I think. Yeah, I don't know. I think I made it up. One, one of the things I'm enjoying about doing these podcasts during the time of pandemic is in talking to people, we get we get insight into their worlds. We get to play voyeur and see how the, these people who we admire live. Uh, not surprising at all to me that you are in a room surrounded by books. You strike me as a very well-read person. You're, you're certainly garrulous. You've got a wonderful way of communicating. And I don't think you can have that level of communication without being well read. Um, I don't think you can be pretentious like me without having <laughs> at least saying that you've read a whole bunch of the books on this shelf. Um, also there, true. There are people that I know who have this great natural capacity to just communicate and in ways that, that really click. Um, but uh, as uh, as T.S. Eliot said about Juna Barnes's Nightwood in the foreword, um, he, he said, you don't have to be a poet to enjoy this book, but it really helps. Um, it, you don't have to be, you know, profoundly and broadly read to be able to articulate your feelings, but it helps you you know, expand your vocabulary and, and your reference points and be able to pull uh, important quotes from all over the place. And, and to me, that's something that matters. To other people, it doesn't. Uh, but yes, uh, it's, a, it's a whole lot of books. And I, I, do, I do love them. Uh, and that's just part of the collection. There's more of them. Uh, there's also the workshop over here that's, I know I'm not supposed to be moving around. I'm sorry, Dad. Uh, <laughs> that's all of the books that I'm finishing up, all of the uh, burnout at the hydrogen bar commissions. Uh, I love it. I'll bring a couple of them over with me and we can look at them instead of my moving around. Because I'm not even on my phone. I'm not modern. I don't have to do that. It's me carrying my laptop around in my hand. That's adorable. Uh, but why good. thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, look at that. That's so cool. That's, um, I took a series of 30 Charles Dickens, the hardcovers, his full collection. And so you can see that they're nice and nice and thick and uh, chopped them out, took out all the contents and then hand wrote out all the lyrics for the first Chem Lab record, Burn Out at the Hydrogen Bar, and then uh, scanned them on high quality paper and uh, inserted them into the interior. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I love it. I love it. Long live the fucking king. Yes. Um, and they're all, 
jaggedy and raggedy and tattery and aren't we all crazy mess but it was just it's so much fun to have done it and then uh yeah that so is super cool but this is what you know each of the covers is different truly one of a kind i love it yeah. yep so yes books galore i adore them and i'm one of those people that will continue to read them even if everything goes audio one way or another i love the feel of them the texture the smell of them yes you can fall asleep listening to an audio book because your phone's right next to your face but and i know i grew up falling asleep with books on my face i'm sure i'm Me too. that way as well I want to thank uh, Stephanie, Tom, Jeff, Denise, Alina, Brian, David, Mark, Eric, Mike, Justin, Megs, Mary Rose, Pat for watching right now. Thank you for watching First Thing in the Morning here right. in Chicago um, on Facebook Live. Uh, that's Jared from ChemLab on the other side. I think there's this idea that during this time of sheltering and staying at home, creative people are going to woodshed and just be incredibly fertile with their output. Is that you or do you feel... Like it, this is no different from any other time of the year, cre creativity wise. Um, there are a couple of parts to that. Um, I'm lucky in that I'm in a really productive um, uh, trough right now. I'm in this current, this stream, this river of things happening um, that I'm really involved in. The Ultra Terrestrials record has just come out. And so I've been promoting that. The Dog Tablet remixes just came out, and a couple of months before that, the album itself, from which all the remixes come, came out. Um, and there's new ChemLab stuff going on, and I'm working on my uh, Patreon account so that I can put up lots of photos of artwork and my writing and songs that aren't heard anywhere else, ChemLab songs that can't be heard anywhere else, and Dog Tablet stuff, and Ultra Terrestrials, and Ether of Souls. And so there's there's a lot going on that is keeping me wonderfully busy. Uh, I'm working on these book covers and uh, I'm making art, which is thrilling and engaging. Uh oh, you're breaking or you're. And, and it helps distract me from. Uh oh, am I back? You're back. Uh, am I? Hey, that's good. And all this stuff keeps me engaged um, because it's hard to ignore the fact that the world is kind of grinding down around us. It's, I get really frustrated with people who talk about, oh, you should be woodshedding during this time, and you should be writing the great American novel, and you should be working out all the time, and you know, you should be learning a new skill, you should be learning how to bake, you should be using this time appropriately efficiently effectively creatively and it's it's leavened with all of this judgment and i rebel against all of that approach because this isn't working from home this isn't a vacation this isn't yeah. a holiday this is a global flying freaking fucking pandemic and everybody is involved in it and it is huge and we cannot get our arms around not only where we're going to be but where we are right now it's having profound effect on all of us and and i posted about this the other day it's got to be okay to not only acknowledge it but stare at the wall for two hours absolutely to, you know to to get up late to go to work on the fucking sofa it's got to be okay to to race around the house and yell and scream. It's got to be okay to, to grieve and mourn the loss of live shows and art openings and hanging out at the coffee shop. And business it, as usual. Yeah. It's got to be okay to, you know, binge watch things on Netflix for days on end. It's okay. Even if it's, it's Tiger King? Really important. Yeah, doesn't do a damn thing for me. I, you know, I knew guys like that in high school. Why do I want to watch that on TV? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let, let's talk a little bit about the apocalypse. What is it about dark stuff? I love horror movies. I love creepy, unsettling shit. I, I, I think I'm pretty normal. 
but it's the dark stuff that has always appealed to me. We're in the time of pandemic. Things are weird. Things are frightening. Things are uncertain. People are watching Outbreak on Netflix. What is it about the dark, depressing stuff that, that, that speaks to us, speaks to you, speaks to what you created with Ultra Terrestrials? In tribute to... We've got more video issues, stupid technology. Uh, there we go. Uh, are we back? Yes. Yes. You cannot understand true beauty without first plunging to the depths of abject horror. I think to a certain extent it soothes us because uh, our real life is never as bad as whatever it is we're watching. Uh, it isn't the zombie apocalypse. Um, I know that a lot of people are turning to uh, laughter and comedy and love stories right now because, because the Stephen King apocalypse under the dome is altogether too close all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> and I get that. And yet, I'm still, you know, finding lack, the bleak, the hopeless. Um, we live in an age where we're pretty coddled and safe and... Um, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a safe way for us to reach out and feel the edge of the knife blade. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I've always been attracted to it. I always have. And um, certainly lived in death a lot. Uh, I've died twice. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, And even even when I was living my own personal apocalypse, I still still enjoyed, uh, uh, you know, the theater of cruelty and, and Devon and all of it. It just, I don't know, there's, there's some weird kink in us. It might be a modern kink, but I'm not positive. Um, I think that we've always been attracted by the dark. We always sure. have. And theater has always reflected that. Opera has certainly reflected that. Uh, it's part of the human experience as well. You know, uh, you don't appreciate summer without going through winter. Um, sometimes in the summertime, it's really nice to enjoy a little bit of fake winter. I don't know. Uh, That's true. Well, it, ultra terrestrials, basically this is you narrating the fall of hu human civilization as I hear it. <laughs> uh, that's very kind of you. And it, 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 I mean, it really comes across as almost narration. I mean, this is... Mm these are straightforward vocal reads almost. Some of it songs. is, yeah. Um, the, certainly it's, it's such a, a broad, expansive and long running thing that we could, the chunks that we've taken out in listening to this album now, it's so different from uh, earlier stuff it's uh, different from other things that we could release. We could release things where I'm singing all in falsetto. Uh, we could release a whole album where I don't sing at all, where I'm engaging in uh, creating sound. Uh, I have a whole series of non-instrument instruments that I use that we mic up. Uh, I have an old, you remember those wired uh, egg slicers? Yeah, that it makes fantastic sound when you pluck at it, and a couple of the wires are tugged loose, so they make a much more detuned sound. Um, putting a transducer on that and then running it through the board through Tom, who's affecting it, you get some really demented space sounds. Oh, wait, let's talk. All right, there's a demented sound in particular. Is it O2? Um, yeah. is that a theremin? There, there's an almost ear splitting sonic on that song that makes it almost unlistenable. Yep. It's so abrasive. <laughs> uh, that's probably Richard. Uh, at times it gets hard to tell because even though I'll be telling stories, I'll have my phone out and I'll be working weird noise programs on there. Tom takes my vocal signal and sends stuff back again from what he's already creating. So it's really hard to say for sure, though I can, I'm pretty sure
that's Richard just, you know, bending a dog. Yeah, and I love that. But so it's, um, it's not a broad representation of the ultra terrestrial sound. The next thing that people hear, we might try and re-release uh, crammed full of as much minimalism as you can manage um, because that's much more abrasive and it's, it's me howling and shrieking as well as making noise with uh, um, nails in paint cans and saws on the microphone and because we really have no interest in convention and traditional song and rhythm and beat. It's all about each thing telling its own story. I happen to be doing a lot of it with words, but sometimes I'm singing them. Both Richard and Tom are telling their own stories, but it's all very interactive and the three of us playing off of each other. Uh, and it is unremittingly dark and hopeless. <laughs> It is They're perfectly described. Although Throw It All Out has a more conventional, pretty cool <laughs> groove. Yeah, that's got a motoric sort of sort of thing going along through it, kind of uh, noy style, mm -hmm. uh, kind of reminiscent of something like Hollow Gallo, uh, which mm -hmm. I think is great. And why not? Because, you know, why do anything that's expected, including doing the unexpected? And pin select cash sounds like a weird fever dream, kind of. Yeah, uh, yeah, I like that thing. That's that's one of our um, that's one of our rock songs, for sure. Uh, yeah, yep. Because uh, well, it's you know it's got a a verifiable chorus to it, and exactly. Uh, uh, we didn't include um, uh, uh, steak knives, which is one that's got. Uh, get a bit of a chorus to it but there there are a whole host of songs like um, I'll Take the Fifth which is a play on both taking the fifth to not self-incriminate but also the fifth of whiskey and because it's all about um, checking out both intentionally and inadvertently um, where you know I'm singing and there are variations of that song where I'm way up in my falsetto and I stay up there pretty much the whole time which has been really exciting for me because I, I, I never play up in my falsetto range with anything that I've done previously and working with them for so long really got me comfortable with taking all kinds of experimental chances with my voice which then allowed me to approach the stuff with Dog Tablet. Martin approached me right after we had done the 2018 Cold Waves Chem Lab dates. And, and I, I was feeling so humbled and touched to be welcomed back into the arms of a, a scene that I was so much a part of. Uh, it still hits me sometimes. You know, you can't take six years off in the music business, kill off your band, and, and then say to people, hey, I'm gonna come back and do some music for you and expect anybody to give a flying fuck about what you're doing because they're listening to everything that's happened in the past six years. You know, who cares? The nostalgia act. Although don't you think, I, I feel like that's not necessarily true. I feel like we see time and again, examples of bands going away and then a, a legitimate appetite for the band building in the, in the time away. I mean, you can skip an entire generation and then there's a generation of kids who have heard about Chem Lab or other bands and never had the chance. And when they get the opportunity, holy shit, floodgates are open. I, I feel like this happens more often than not. And I feel like sometimes so. you, you need to go away and then come back and you come back brighter and bigger than ever. Mm, I certainly needed to go away to find out what of the Chem Lab formula was important to me. Um, but I think often it's bands who are bigger, who are better, who are more interesting, who cut a, bri a broader swath than we have. And so um, maybe it's just because I'm always in denial and self-deprecating, but I didn't think anyone would give a fuck. But they did. They did. And so I rode off of this high from those dates and Martin got in touch with me and said, hey, I've got to, you know, and we hadn't worked on anything in almost 20 years or been in touch very much. He said, I've got this song and, I, and I've been doing this dog tablet 
thing. I don't know if you know, and I sort of knew. And this is Martin King. Yeah. Yep. Uh, test department, pig face. We had met pretty much 20 years before when we were out um, pig face together, though I knew of him from test department long before I knew him personally. And we clicked on the pig face tour and you know me, I'll start telling stories, but I'll do that at some other point. Fair. And, and I was feeling like, all right, well, I, I want to take some chances and do some interesting stuff. And I've always liked Martin's writing. And he sent me this song and boy, did it just click. And I could hear all of the possibilities of what I could sing on it. And previously in my creative life, I've heard what I can do, but I often can't get there. And I, I know I have the capacity if my voice was better, if my ideas were stronger. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but I often don't arrive. And the things that are recorded always fall fall short for me. All of the records that I've done with Camelab, they fall short for me. The Hellbent stuff, it falls short. Yeah, that's true of any artist, though, don't you think? I mean, I have well, a lot yeah, of musicians watching right now. I'm sure they'd agree with that. It's supposed to. You know, I'm glad that everybody else loves them and that it floats their boat. For me, it's a boat with a hole in it because, because you're always supposed to, you know, be dissatisfied and want to do better. Um, and so... In singing that song, it was it was so fluid and so easy, and his setup at home was just comfortable, and the two of us clicked like that. It was gorgeous, and it just fell together. And so that all the stuff that I've done, stretching and experimenting and pushing my voice out into the bizarrest of places with ultra terrestrials really informed my willingness to take chances with the dog tablet stuff. And for the first time in my life, I'm proud of some of the songs that I've created. That's when, you, when you first really reached out to me to, to, to uh, tell me about dog tablets, you said, Martin and I have created a down-tempo dark forest of Grimm's fairy tale creepy confections. I saved that quote because that's it. And it, you don't need a better elevator pitch than that. That says it all. I mean, this is cinematic atmospheric <laughs> stuff. Yeah. I, I think I, after my first listen, I wrote back to you and said, this is get shit done music. Like, this is stuff I have on in the background when I just wanted to put my nose down, get my work done. Like it, it, it's propulsive, but it's, it's also cool and vibey. Uh, it, it hits a lot of notes for me. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, wow. And Hazmat, <laughs> Hazmat's totally badass. God, that's such a fun song. It's such a fun song. I don't know if you've heard all the remixes, but... So um, that's Muscle and Bone. So Feathers and Skin was round one, and then the remixes yeah. are Muscle and Bone. Yep, yep. And it's and I, got a deliriously broad selection of people on it. Uh, Mary Biker from Pop Will Eat Itself uh, remixed Hazmat. And, and I just, I love it. It's, it's pushy, but not as pushy as, you know, like a dance floor anthem, which there are some of those on there as well. Um, but I was, I was really, uh, I figured I'd just throw a whole bunch of arrows out into the dark and ask a whole host of people that I thought would produce boundary pushing and concept pushing mutations of the songs and everybody came back with something that went way beyond what either martin or i were expecting uh barrett from boot blacks it's his remix is chilly and distant oh i love it it's like this sliver of ice just going in at the base of your skull it's fantastic the dead agent one is the sort of electronic music, if I could make electronic music, I would be making that. It was, ah, it's just bitty and kludgy and it's all sharp angles. It's great. Uh, but, and I could talk about all of them. Curse turned in a fantastic one. Burton from Fear Factory and Ascension of the Watchers. His is like this horror story. I mean, it's skin-crawlingly disturbing. It's just, ah, 
I'm so pleased. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have Dan Milligan from uh, Joy Thieves, who mm -hmm. turns in something that could have come off of um, Sons and Fascination, uh, you know, Simple Minds record. It's just, it's so 80s, anthemic, new wave. Simple Minds really keeps coming back to me. And yet with a me bit too. of stainless right steel providers you. thrown into it as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I keep coming back to Simple Minds and Revco uh, as well. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Uh, I got a comment on the Facebook Live, and I didn't see what she's referring to, but I'm, I'm sure you'll know exactly what she's saying. Jared, forever love your contribution to industrial, but I was so moved by your tribute post to John Prine and the unseen members of society. Thank you for that. So obviously when John Prine passed, you, you wrote about that. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that I had managed to get through Bill Withers and uh and then john prine died i grew up listening to both of those uh you know 72 still bill was uh always on my turntable um john prine i love the way that he crafts a, a simple but effective hook completely unpretentious and completely engaged with the hilarity and heartbreak of the human condition and describes it so well uh i was uh yeah i was really touched by it and um the way that he writes about these recognizable characters in the same way that stephen king develops really recognizable understandable characters um i uh yeah, I posted about it, and you know, I figure a bunch of my fans who are all like, mm -ts, mm -ts, mm -ts, mm -ts, mm -ts, like John, what's that? And they'll play something, you know, uh, and just go, wow, well, okay. I thought I knew all about Jared. Like, yeah, well, you know. Well, see, I, I I think that idea of people only listen to one style of music, I think that's kind of bullshit. I mean, if you look at anyone's phone or computer it's not all one yeah. genre we all we all deviate go in different directions and at the end of the day specific to john prine we can all appreciate a great storyteller yep especially yep. in music and that's what he was yep. i mean yeah. folk, folk type stuff might not be for everybody but you can at least admire oh yeah there, there was there was something wonderful going on there oh indeed and if you lift the lyrics uh, off of the stage and put them on the page then it doesn't matter what the exactly. the, the musical trappings are if it's a well-crafted piece of writing, then it doesn't matter, uh, and it will affect you. And his writing was tremendously well-crafted. Hello in there is the video that I included, and it's all about how, um, as he says in the chorus, um, old trees just get stronger every day, and you know, old rivers get wilder, uh, old people just get weaker. And you know, we begin to push them to the side, and we don't want to see them, and they are, they're the repositories of our history. They are filled with experience. Whenever someone dies, a library dies with them. And we, we don't acknowledge how important they are. And we don't acknowledge their, their place in our society. We're engaged with and fascinated with and hypnotized with youth and the new. And in fact, youth can only bring so much. And a lifetime of experience is so incredibly valuable and so easily lost. You know, we tear down old architecture to put up a nice glass box. Great, little boxes with the topses and they're all made a little ticky tacky. You know, I could go on and on with a little bit of uh, Pete there, but it just, uh, it really touched me because we are in so much isolation right now. And for me, I'm in isolation, but I can type, I can put stuff out on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. I can put stuff on my, my Patreon account and, and, and talk to people and interact with people. I don't have to pick up a phone. I can look at you right now, sitting there happily in your home with your Sin City poster and Gary Newman and your records, and we're, we're hanging out with you. You can see my books around me. Imagine if it was my mom at 80, uh, she, what, 94 she would have been. Here's a woman who, born in the 1920s, 
she used to hold her breath when writing me an email because she was afraid if she breathed too much, somehow a finger would slip and she'd break the computer. The isolation that this engenders, that this currently requires, yeah, it's hard for us. We don't get to party with all the other people at the show. You know, we don't get to go to the coffee shop. Can you imagine what it's like for someone who's in their 80s? Right. And they don't, they don't have that. You know, they don't have the computer. They don't, my God, can they work this? Right. No. And if they can, then, you know, they're really struggling with it. And more power to the ones who can. And if you think that I'm insulting you by saying that you can't, you don't know that I'm actually treating you with great respect, uh, you know, because I know that my folks would have struggled with it. And that isolates them even, even further. We're incredibly lucky. And so I just wanted to remind people that, there must be volunteer organizations around that could help the elderly. There must be ways that people can reach out in their own community, that people can make grocery deliveries. It's what I've been doing. My wife has volunteered for the NHS, which is the National Health Service. And anybody out there who doesn't understand socialism and yet puts the concept down, I have free health care. I'm on four different prescriptions. They're free. They don't cost me anything. They cost me my taxes that I pay. My wife is on medication that she must take every day. It's free. When prescriptions cost, what is it? It went up a year and a half ago. It's now nine pounds for a monthly prescription. Nine pounds. Call that 15 bucks. Got it. Socialism at work. There it is, the National Health Service. We've been going and helping to deliver medication to people around in the neighborhood. You know, Good for you. The, the people that need it the most are also the most scared. They are also the most in danger. And we don't see them. Oh, look at that old guy. You know, oh, there's Granny in the line in front of me counting out her chain. 67, 60. Oh, dear, that's a button. I better start again. One, you know, and you're fuming, but in fact, that's you. That's me. Exactly right. I'm going to be 60 in December. Give me 20 years. I, I hope someone's going to deliver some groceries to us. And, and you, the fact that you're going to be 60, it just speaks to the fact that age is bullshit and relative. You, you don't uh, look, look or behave like you're a 60 year old or what's conventionally thought of as a 60 year old man. No, I certainly don't behave that way. <laughs> Tell that to the tax man of my mortgage company. Uh huh. When are you going to grow up? So, all right, Jared, I, I've monopolized enough of your time this morning. Although, really, where are we going? <laughs> what do we have going on? Oh, indeed. Indeed. You know, so, late so just, to get to work. Oh, so no. just to catch people up, uh, dog tablets, ultra terrestrials, those are, those are new and available for consumption on all streaming services. We can enjoy that. Uh, yes, your and if you want to buy it, you can go to Bandcamp. Yay! Support your local artist. Uh, I, I would, I should have mentioned that Bandcamp is a wonderful resource for artists, especially as artists cannot be on the road right now, cannot perform and make income in the conventional ways. A lot of bands have merch available on Bandcamp, uh, hard copies of their music, be it CD or vinyl. That is an outstanding way to support musicians who could really use the support right now. Yes, Not just Jared, but across the board. Yep. Help musicians out. Well said. Yep. Uh, you know, you know, I think you're delightful, and I really appreciate talking to you. Thank you so much. Really quickly, thank you to the woman who said thank you about the John Prine thing. Um, and thanks to everybody that's watching. Um, I appreciate all the support in the support department. I, I do have a Patreon account. Uh, it's five bucks a month, and there's all kinds of... I'm about to post a clutch of uh, cassette demos from when we were first recording Burnout, the first oh, camera and stuff that is not going to be released along with the re-release of the Burnout record that we're putting out at some point this year. Uh, all things, you know, being equal, um, which will be, the CD will be uh, two parts. It'll be regular Burnout and then uh, a disc of cassette demos that haven't been heard before a love whole it. bunch of them from that period I, I love that stuff and we're doing it
on vinyl as well for the first time ever. So it'll be a gatefold. So you got two discs saving, serving the same purpose. Um, but uh, the Patreon account allows me to just type long screeds about stuff and put up photographs of artwork and music. Um, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, it's small at the moment, but it's just starting out. I'm going to start doing interviews with people as well, which I think would be really fun. And maybe we'll turn it around and I'll get to interview you, which I think would be really cool because you ask me questions all the time, but I don't know a damn thing about you. I'm an open book. I, so are you, are you doing like a podcast or is that the, is that the goal? I, I think that's what I'm going to head towards. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I, I think that's a great idea. I, uh, I would listen to that every week. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, and if there's a week when I don't see you, I'm going to get all nervous and be like, James, James, what's going on? Are you okay? You okay? But you know me, I love to talk. And so it'd be a really good challenge for me to shut the fuck up and listen for a change. I, I yes, it would. All right. I'm going to kill the Facebook live. Thank you for watching on Facebook and, and paying you. attention this morning. I know it's early here in Chicago, but thank you. And again, where, where else do we have to be at this point? Really? Right. All right. Thank right. you. Facebook live.